regarding can it be given on Muslims? According to Ibn Hazm, even a Muslim can touch in the state of ceremonial impurities. Whether it's right or wrong, you can refer to his books and check it up. But if you agree with that, a non-Muslim can also touch. But my main argument which I put forward, as the Quran says, reason with the people with hikmah. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Wal ma uzat al hafna. Wajadilum billati asan. From Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 125 he says, Invite all the way of the Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. If you analyze, the Quran gives a challenge. One of the challenges I mentioned in the answer to Ali Flam meme. That try and produce a surah like the Holy Quran. If all the human beings got together, the Quran says in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 88, that if all the human beings got together, along with the jinn, they will not be able to produce the life of the Quran. And again the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 82, it says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرَانَ وَلَوْ قَانَا مِنْ إِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِي اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا They do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. There would have been many discrepancies. So Quran gives the challenge to those who don't believe in the Quran, the non-Muslims. That do you not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradictions. So when the non-Muslim has to consider the Quran and Allah gives a challenge, what naturally has to hold it in the hand? He can't check whether the Quran has contradiction or without holding it. So when Allah gives a challenge to them, and if they can hold it, then who are we to stop them? And if Allah holds me responsible on the day of judgment, I said in my talk, I will be in the company of my beloved Prophet. When the beloved Prophet can give verses of the Quran to non-Muslim, do you think you are more holier than the Prophet? You are more holier than the Prophet? Prophet gave verses of the Quran to non-Muslims. So why can't we give? So if you analyze and read the Quran with understanding and the Sahih Hadith with understanding, you realize that we should deliver the message to the whole of humankind, including non-Muslim, as well as give them the message of the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Good night. I wish to express my sincere appreciation for the marvelous task that you have performed today. Alhamdulillah, you have done a splendid job. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah gives me and all the boys present here and everyone present here to implement all the things that you have disclosed today. Coming to my question is, I would like to ask you regarding one question which ponders some non-Muslims allege that the Quran which we Muslims possess today was compiled under the authority of the third caliph, Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So they say, how do you prove that it is the word of God? Could you please express your views on that? The brother has posed a very important question, and I do agree with him that there are many non-Muslims who allege that the Holy Quran you have today has been compiled and authorized by the third Khalifa, Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, and all the remaining copies he burned. So but naturally there are many types of Quran, and only one has been authorized and compiled by Hazrat Usman, Therefore, may Allah be pleased with him. Therefore, there are many versions, and the one that you have may not be the word of God, etc., etc. Regarding how to prove it is the word of God, you can refer to my video cassette, Is the Quran the word of God? That this Quran, logically you can prove it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding why did he burn, did he compile, etc., it's completely wrong to say that Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, he is the person who compiled the Quran and authorized it. In fact, the Quran was compiled in the presence of the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Whenever any verse of the Holy Quran was revealed to a beloved Prophet, he immediately memorized it and then proclaimed it to his Sahabas. Their Sahabas memorized it and immediately the Prophet asked the Sahabas to write it down. And whenever it was written down, the Prophet checked it. We know very well the Prophet was Ummi. He could not read or write, but he had a method of checking. For example, the first two verses to be revealed of Surah Iqra, Surah Allah chapter 96 verse 1 and 2 is Iqra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq, khalaq al insami alaq. He recited that, dictated it to the Sahabas, they wrote it down. After they wrote it down, the Prophet said, read it now, so they read. Iqra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq, khalaq al insami alaq. Okay, correct. If there was a mistake, he used to correct it. So whatever was revealed, he used to tell the Sahabas, he used to memorize it, Sahaba used to memorize it, he used to check the memory of the Sahabas, whether they memorized it correctly or not. Then, after that, when they wrote it, 
is to check whether the written material is right or wrong. And whenever any revelation came, he even told the scribe that this work of the Holy Quran will come after so and so surah, so and so verse. All this was divine. Because the way the Quran was revealed, we don't have Surah Ikra verse 1 and 2 in the beginning of the Quran. It is the 96th chapter. So whenever it was revealed, after it was told by beloved Prophet to the scribes that this verse will come after this surah. And this that we have today, the order, is the same order as Allah Himayfus said in the heaven. Now you should realize one thing, that every Ramadan, Archangel Gabriel, he rehearsed, and the Prophet rehearsed whatever was revealed till that time with Archangel Gabriel. And the last Ramadan before the Prophet died, this Quran was rehearsed twice, in order. So even the Quran from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, whatever was written down, some of the ayahs of the Quran were written down on camel saddles, some on tanned leather, some on scrap leather, some on flat pieces of thin stone, some on leafless palm leaves, some on shoulder blades, different materials. After the Prophet expired, at the time of the first Khalifa, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Allah be pleased with him, after a couple of years, in the Battle of Yamama, there were several Huffas, those who know the Quran by memory, by heart, they were killed in the battle. So that was a thing which troubled Hazrat Abu Bakr and even Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with them both. So then, Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he called all the scribes who wrote when the Prophet used to recite to them, and he appointed Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit, who was the best of the scribes, who had the best memory. He said, oh, what you do, you collect all the material and put it in one material. The Quran was compiled, the order was present, but it was not present in one material, in different materials, stone, shoulder blade, leather, etc. So what under the supervision of Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him, along with the other Sahabas, all this material was copied in one material, in order. So present in speech, in a sort of a book form, was done by Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. But the order and everything was already present in same sheet. It was done by Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. This copy was later given to Hazrat Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, when he became the second Khalifa. And after he expired, he gave it to his daughter, Hazrat Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her, who was also the wife of the beloved Prophet. Now, during the reign of Hazrat Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, there were certain disagreements between the Muslims who stayed far away, since Islam kept on spreading. Islam spread, there was some disagreement regarding the dialect, regarding the pronunciation of the Quran, in which there were arguments between the Muslims. So to prevent the argument, Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, that we have to see to it that the correct copy greets the various parts of the Muslim world. So what he did, he called again the scribes and took the copy from Hazrat Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of the beloved Prophet and the daughter of Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. And he asked the scribes under again a committee to copy it again. And after copying, he asked the Muslim world that whatever copy that you have with you, you burn it. Why? There was a reason. Because every time the Prophet proclaimed a certain verse of the Holy Quran, or many Sabahs wrote it down. But it's not possible that all the Sabahs knew each and every verse. Some may not be present when the Prophet said, so if someone has, instead of more than 6,000 verses, he may have 5,000 verses, he may think that these 5,000 verses are complete Qur'an. So to prevent that, and whatever they wrote down, the Prophet didn't check it personally, the Prophet didn't go to every Sabah's house and, oh, what do you write, show it to me, no. When they recited, people wrote down. It was not checked by the Prophet personally. Since it was not checked by the Prophet, there were chances that these copies which people have with them may carry mistakes. So for that reason, Hazrat Usman said, burn the other copies, not because to say that there were many versions of the Qur'an. There was only one authorized, compiled copy of the Holy Qur'an during the time of the Prophet. The same copy, to make it more easily accessible to the world, he had it sent to various parts of the Muslim Ummah, various parts. Later on, after that, the Arabs could read. There were no Fatta Dhamma Kathra, no dietary marks were there on the Qur'an. Because the Arabs can read without the vowels, without the dactyl marks. Later on, 
the fifth Yamat Khalifa under the reign of Abdul Malik Marwan from 66 to 86 Hijri. Under him, there was a governor in Iraq, Yusuf bin Ajaj. He gave the diacritical mark, Fatta Dhamma Katra, which we call as Zabar Zirpesh in India. So that the people could pronounce the Quran, those who are non arabs who do not know Arabic as a language, they could pronounce it easier. So even what we have today, Fatta Dhamma Katra, the copy which was originally dictated, copied from the original source by Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit and then given to various parts of the world. One such copy is yet present in the Koptaki Museum in Turkey. It's present there. It's present there. If you check up, it's the same. But it will be without the diacritical marks. But just because the diacritical marks are different, that does not mean Quran is different. Because Quran is a recitation. If any Arab who knows how to recite the Quran without the Fatta Dhamma Kasara, if he recites that Quran, and if you recite this Quran, it's 100% the same. There will be no difference. So, Alhamdulillah, the Quran that we have was under the personal supervision of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was compiled, and what we have today was actually compiled by the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was made accessible to us by Hazrat Usman. And whatever Allah says in the Quran has come true, He clearly says in Surah al hijr chapter 15, verse number 9, that we have revealed the Holy Quran, and we will guard it from corruption. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum brother. Uh, my question is, how would you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Quran is written by a Satan? Thank you. The sister asked the question that how will you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Quran has been written by Satan? Sister, if, 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 if Satan had written the Quran, why would he mention in Surah Nahal? Chapter 16, verse number 98, that when you recite the Quran, say, Auz Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. <laughs> Why will Satan write in his own book that whenever you recite my book, say, I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed? Why will Satan write in his own book? Why will he curse himself in his own book? Further, if you read Quran, says in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse number 200, that whenever you get a message from Satan, seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why will the Satan himself write in his own book that when you hear a message from me, you go and seek refuge with Allah. And for the Satan, Allah is an avowed enemy. So why will he say that go to my enemy and seek refuge? And further if you analyze that these allegations are not new allegations. These allegations are very old. Even when the revelation came to the Prophet, even the pagans at that time said that these revelations are from Satan. That's the reason that the verses of Surah Waqiyah, which I quoted in my talk, chapter 56, verse number 77 to 80, it was revealed in reply to the allegations laid by the mushriks of Makkah that the Prophet receives the revelation from the Satan. And this revelation says, again I'm quoting, that the Quran is the book most honorable. It's a book well guarded, well protected, who none can touch but those who are pure and clean. This is a revelation from the Lord of the world saying that this Kitab in Maknoon, this well protected book, which is then the Lord Himmah Fools, none can touch but the angels, those who are pure, and we know devil is not pure. So Quran is saying, the devil, the Satan, can come nowhere close to Lord Himmah Fools. Nowhere close. So it's impossible that he can bring this revelation. It's further again confirmed in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Shura, chapter 26, verse number 210 to 212, that no Satan has bought this Holy Quran, the revelation of the Holy Quran. It does not suit him, neither can he produce it. And we have kept him so far that he cannot even hear it. So the Quran itself says that this book is not from Satan. To prove it's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can see my video cassette is the Quran, the word of God. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Sarfraj and my question is, is it correct to have Quran Hani, that is reciting of the whole Quran during an opening ceremony or on the death of any Muslim. The brother asked the question that is it right to recite the Quran, have Quran Khani, recite the Quran in opening ceremonies, death of a person. And when we ask some of the Muslims that why was the Quran revealed, 
Some people say it was revealed to be recited during opening ceremony for housewarming ceremony when a person dies. There is no authentic hadith which I know of, neither any verse of the Holy Quran, which says that the Prophet did this thing. People gather there, they collect, and they rattle the Holy Quran at 100 miles per hour. I've got no objection if people want to complete the research of the Holy Quran. Alhamdulillah, it's good. But what I say, that if you call 30 people to recite the Holy Quran, each one reads the para of the Arabic text, I tell them, why don't you call 60 people? Instead of reading one para of the Holy Quran Arabic, it's preferable you recite half para along with translation and call 60 people. If there are less people, then instead of they taking one hour per para, tell them you take two hours. Take two hours for completing the Quran. Have Pahmul Quran. Have Pahmul Quran. And you read the Arabic text and along with that read the translation. Irrespective whether it serves the purpose or not. Surely, the person who reads the Qur'an with understanding, it will surely benefit him. He will get sawab. Surely, it will help him in his life. It will be a guidance to his lifestyle. So, if anyone wants to recite the full Qur'an, I'm for it, but have Fahmul Qur'an. Recite along with the translation. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, during the course of a discussion, I was confronted with a question like this, that the Muslims believe in the theory of abrogation. That is, certain early verses of the Qur'an, which were mansook, were abrogated by later revealed verses. Now, does this imply that God was wrong and later corrected the verses? The sisters asked the question that there are certain Muslims who believe in abrogation theory and certain verses were revealed later on and the earlier verses were abrogated. So is there a contradiction in the Holy Quran and did Allah make a mistake and then correct it? Sister, the theory of abrogation is derived from a verse in the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 106, which says that we cause not any verse or any revelation to be abrogated or forgotten, but we substitute it with things similar or better. And Allah has power over all things. The same message is repeated again in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 120, that Allah does not cause to be forgotten, but He substitutes it with things better or similar. The Arabic word here is ayah, which can be translated as revelation, also as signs, as verses. If we take it as a revelation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't cause the previous revelations to be forgotten, but substitute it with revelations which are better or similar, but naturally it refers to that the previous revelations, the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, they have been substituted by the last and final revelation, the Holy Quran, which, but natural, no Muslim should have objection to. If you take the meaning as ayah, as verses of the Quran only, then the Quran will say that we do not cause any verses of the Holy Quran to be forgotten, but we substitute it with something better or similar. If we take ayah as verse of the Holy Quran, that means other verses have been revealed which are better or similar. But this does not mean that the verse which was revealed earlier no longer holds good today, and it contradicts. There are many Muslims who misunderstand this second interpretation, and they say it means that the verses that were revealed earlier, they have been abrogated. They no longer hold good, we should not follow it. We have to follow that same verse, dealing with the same topic, which was revealed later on. And they feel that the verse revealed earlier contradicts with the verse which was revealed later. Therefore, we Muslims should only follow the later verse and not the first verse. There is a little bit of misunderstanding about this concept. Let me give you an example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals certain things. Later on, He reveals verses dealing with the same topic, with the same subject. But that does not mean there is a contradiction. He gives you additional information. After giving that additional information, the verses that were revealed later on is sufficient to speak about that subject. But that does not mean it contradicts with the early verses. Let me give you an example. That regarding the challenge which I mentioned, in one of my answers, that produce a surah like it. 
First Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the challenge to the humankind in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 88 that if all the human beings and the jinns they got together they would not be able to produce a recital like the Holy Quran. The same message is repeated in Surah Tur chapter 52 verse 34 that you cannot produce the Holy Quran even if all the men and jinns got together you can't produce the Holy Quran. Then the challenge is made easier in Surah Hud, chapter 11, verse number 13, that you will not be able to produce even 10 surahs. Then further on in Surah Yunus, chapter 10, verse 38, the challenge is further simplified. You can't even produce one surah. And in Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse number 23, 24, which I decided earlier, the challenge is made more easier, that you will not be able to produce a surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. Surah Yunus chapter 10 verse 38 says, can't produce a surah like the Quran. Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse 23 24 says, you can't even produce a surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. The challenge is made easier. That does not mean that the earlier challenge does not hold good. Suppose if I tell a person who is dumb, who is ignorant, that you dumb person, you can't even pass standard 10. Then after a few minutes I realize he is more dumb. I tell him, you can't even pass standard 5. Then I say you can't even pass standard 1. Then I say you can't even pass the nursery kg. That does not mean I'm contradicting. But my last statement that you can't even pass nursery includes the first three statements. When I say you can't pass nursery, it's taken for granted you can't even pass standard 1, standard 5 and standard 10. That does not mean it's contradicting. When I say you can't pass standard 10, you can't pass standard kg, it's not contradicting. Contradiction is something which you can't follow simultaneously. If you can follow simultaneously both the verses of the Quran, it's not a contradiction. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simplifying the challenge. Some people say, no, the first verse of Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 88 is wrong, it should not be followed today. They don't understand. They think it's a contradiction because of the lack of understanding. It's not a contradiction. Contradiction is something which is opposing. Let me give you one more example. The prohibition of intoxicants in the Quran came down in stages. The first verse dealing with intoxicants was Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 219 which says that when they ask thee concerning wine and gambling, tell them in it is loss and profit. But the loss is more than the profit. The next verse dealing with intoxicants, see the prohibition came in stages, why? Because to reform the Arab society, it had to be done in stages. They were alcoholics, they were drunkards. It was difficult to reform them, it came in stages. The next verse dealing with intoxicants was of Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 43, which says that do not pray with your mind before. While praying, having intoxicants is haram. And the final prohibition was revealed that mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amun, O you who believe, innam al khamru al maithiru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al azlamu, Dedication of stones, divination of arrows, wisdom in Amali Shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. Pashtanibullah lakum taflihun. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. After this verse was revealed, there was total prohibition of alcohol. 100%. That does not mean that this verse contradicts with the early verse. Even the early verse is correct. That in the alcohol, there is loss and profit. The loss is more than profit. It's not nullified. Even the second revelation, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 43 says that do not pray with your mind before the whole good. What people are misunderstanding that if the Quran says do not pray with your mind before, that means if you are not praying, alcohol is allowed. That is the misunderstanding. If the Quran would have said that do not pray with your mind before and you can have alcohol when you are not praying, then there is a contradiction. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most wise. He knows what he is going to reveal. He can't make a mistake. So that to bring the prohibition in stages. At that time, only having alcohol during salah was prohibited. Quran does not say other time it's halal. It's silent. If you would have mentioned, while not praying you can have alcohol, and then afterwards say it is prohibited for always, then there's a contradiction. So people, because they can't reason out the compatibility between the two verses, they have come out that it contradicts, Therefore, you should not follow the other verses. For example, if I tell my friend that, see, when you're touring, don't go to New York. 
Then I tell him, don't go to USA. Then I say, don't go to America, the continent of America. I'm not contradicting. I'm giving him more and more information. First time saying, don't go to New York, don't go to USA, don't go to America. But when I say, don't go to the continent of America, even USA is included. Even Canada is included. Even New York is included. If I say, don't go to continent of America, it is sufficient enough. I need not again say, don't go to USA or don't go to New York. Therefore, when Quran says that alcohol is totally prohibited, it includes Surah Nisa chapter 443, that even while praying, it is haram. But that does not mean it's contradicting. It's giving you more information. Therefore, anyone who says that the verses of Quran contradict, that's the meaning of abrogation theory, then they have failed to understand the Quran, because the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 82, Afala yatadabbaroon al qurana walau qana min indi gairillah lawajudu fi ikhtilaf an kafira They do not they confer the Quran with care had it been from anyone besides Allah there would have been many contradictions So there is something like mansook but mansook does not mean contradicting it means better information Hope that answers the question Brother Zakir my question is all Muslims follow one and the same Quran then why are there so many sects among Muslims? So let us pose the question that if all the Muslims follow one and the same Quran, Alhamdulillah, then why are there so many sects that we have? The Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 103, it says, Wa tafimu bi hablillahi jamiyo, wa la tafaruku. Hold all together fastly to the rope which Allah stretches out and be not divided. Allah says, hold to the rope of Allah. Which is the rope of Allah? The Holy Quran. Allah says, if the Muslims hold to the rope of Allah and it says, hold together and be not divided. Double emphasis. Besides holding together, also be united. Double emphasis. But when we ask a person, who is he? Some say Shia, some say Sunni, some say Hanafi, some say Shafi. The Holy Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 159, that anyone who divides the religion and makes sex, you have nothing to do with him. And Allah will tell him the truth. But when you ask a person that who are you? Some Muslims say that I am a Hanafi. Some say I'm a Shafi, some say I'm a Hamli, some say I'm a Malaki, some say Shia, some say Sunni, some say Deobandi, some say Barevli, some say Aga Khani, some say Boris. Who are the beloved prophets? Hanafi? Or the Shafi? Or the Malaki? Or the Shia? Or the Sunni? You are the Muslim! The Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 52, that Isa was a Muslim. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, that Abraham was Salam, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. Our beloved Prophet, he was a Muslim. Nowhere does the Holy Quran say that you should say you are a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Hanbali or a Malaki. The Holy Quran says in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33, Allah inna ni minal Muslimin. Say, I am of those who bow in the will of Allah. Say, I am amongst the Muslims. The Holy Quran says, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, the same verse which our beloved Prophet dictated to non-Muslim kings when inviting them towards Islam. It says, that Fakulu Shadu Bianna Muslim Moon. I bear witness that I am a Muslim. The Prophet never said that I am bear witness that I am a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Maliki or a Deobandi. No. He said, I bear witness I am a Muslim. All these four great scholars, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Humble, Alhamdulillah, I respect them. They were great scholars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for their research and for their hard work. Inshallah, they'll get the reward. But, if anyone poses the question, if someone agrees with the teachings, with the views of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Humble, Imam Malik, I've got no objection. If someone follows certain views of Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him, Imam Shafi, may Allah be pleased with him, with Imam Humble, may Allah be pleased with him, Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with him. If you follow certain views, I have got no objection. But if someone asks you the question, what are you, you should say, I'm a Muslim. There are certain people who argue, that see beloved Prophet said, that my Ummah will be divided into 73 sects. 
and they're quoting a hadith, which is there in Abu Dawood, hadith number 4579. And it does say that a beloved prophet said that my ummah will be divided into 73 sects. A prophet said a ummah will be divided. He never said you should be divided. The Holy Quran says, Wa tafimu bi hablillahi jamia wala tafaraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly, be not divided. Holy Quran says, Surah Anam chapter 6, verse 159, Do not be divided. Don't make sex in a religion. Holy Prophet also never said make sex. He predicted there will be sex. And the other hadith is mentioned in Trimedi, hadith number 171. It says that the Prophet said, My ummah will be fragmented into 73 sex. And all of them will go to hellfire except one. And the companions asked him, that, oh Prophet, which one? The Prophet said, those who follow me and my companions. Those who are amongst me and my companions. The Quran says, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul. So anyone follows the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith, he is on the true path. I have got no objection if somebody believes with great scholars, with their views, as long as it matches with the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. But let him be the biggest scholar in the world. If it view disagrees, contradicts, with the Quran and the Sai Hadith, you don't have to follow that. If the Muslim Ummah reads the Holy Quran with understanding, inshallah, this problem will be solved. Hope that answers the question. Uh, we'll give a preference to the slips also. I said secondly, that preference to the slips, not no preference to the slips. I think we have to give the slips also some opportunity. Why was the Holy Quran revealed in Arabic? And, as you have rightly pointed out, the Arabic language as such should be taught from childhood for obvious reasons. What is the IRF doing to achieve this end in the existing context of the system of education in our country? M.C. Abbas, Business and Secretary of Arabic Academy, Hyderabad. The first question posed was, why was the Holy Quran revealed in Arabic? And second is, what efforts is the IRF making in this field. The Holy Quran, though it is meant for the whole of humankind, for the whole of humanity, the reason it was even Arabic is because the Holy Quran was revealed in Arabia. And it had to be revealed in the language of that land. It can't be revealed in a foreign language. Similarly, even the previous revelation, like Torah, Zabur, Injil, they were revealed in Hebrew in the language of that land. So when the revelation comes in a land, it should be in the language of that land. Point number two, that since it was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but natural, it had to be in his mother tongue. If the Quran was revealed in a language which was foreign to the messenger, on whom it was revealed, then surely those people who knew the language better, those people whose mother tongue was the language of the Quran, Surely, they would approach the Prophet and say that what will you explain to us about a book whose language is our mother tongue and it's not your mother tongue. So, but natural, it had to be revealed in the language which was familiar, which was the mother tongue of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which was Arabic. Besides that, Arabic, though it's an ancient language, yet it is a living language. There are more than 150 million people who yet today speak Arabic. More than 150 million people. The other languages in which the other scriptures are present, like Sanskrit, ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, all these are dead languages. Only a handful of scholars know these languages. So if anyone wants to change that scripture, it's very easy, no one will come to know. But today, suppose someone wants to change the Arabic Quran, it will be impossible. There are more than 150 million people who know Arabic as a language. Though it's ancient, it's a living language. I said in my talk that Arabic is a rich language. Every word has a deep meaning. Sometimes you may require several words or even sentences to describe its meaning. The Arabic, many words in it, have got several meanings. Many a time, more than one imply. For example, the first two verses of the Holy Quran to be revealed from Surah Ikra or Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2, was, Ikra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq, 
خلق الانسان من علق the arabic word ikra it means read it also means recite it also means proclaim the arabic word rab besides meaning lord it also means sustainer and cherisher and provider the arabic word khalaqa have got another few meanings besides meaning creator it can mean something which is created from nothing it can mean something which is created from pre existing material khalaqa also means to plan to program khalaqa also means to make smooth the arabic word alaqa it means congealed out of blood it means something which clings it means a leech like substance so if i have to translate correctly i have to translate the verse of ikra bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq khalaqal insana min alaq as read recite proclaim in the name of your lord cherisher sustainer provider who created who planned who programmed who made smooth khalaqal insana min alaq who created the human being from something which clings a leech like substance a congealed lot of blood difficult arabic language is rich therefore in short way telegraphic message it can convey a lot of message there are various ways of reading the quran one is tadabbur e quran reading superficial meaning one is tadabbur e quran having a deep meaning you read the arabic portion of the quran even if you read a thousand times you won't get tired you will enjoy it the more you read and besides that if you analyze that arabic to write arabic it requires less space for example if i write muhammad mim ha mim dal pata dama kam don top top down pata dama kasra i want to repeat mim letter just for shadda shortcut if i have read in english i have read m u h u m m e d or m o h a m m e d if you analyze the time taken the space taken the ink taken and the energy taken to write arabic as compared to english language and other language it is one third to half less space required less ink required less energy less time and just because the quran was revealed in arabic that does not mean it is not meant for the full world for the whole of humanity suppose a french doctor he does a research in french regarding the treatment of a certain disease that does not mean that treatment can't be used in usa and india it can be used and if someone wants to analyze that treatment he can either learn french as a language and analyze the research or he can have the translation read similarly the arabic quran was revealed for the whole of human kind they can either learn arabic or they can read the translation to acquire the guidance hope that answers the question next question why do some muslims write 786 for bismillah is it correct the question posed was that why do people some muslims write 786 for bismillah and is it correct there are some of the muslims who have given certain numerical values for certain arabic alphabets and when you add up this value you get a certain figure so the people some people that say it six because if you add up the value of ba sin bismillah each letter of of bismillah if you add up the value it comes to a total of 786 similarly some people like 92 for muhammad peace be upon him sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you add up the value of each letter of his name it comes to 92 whether it's right or wrong i do not find any sahih hadith or any quranic verses which agrees with the system of shortcut there are some muslims who argue with me and tell me let's see since we cannot write the arabic bismillah rahman rahim on invitation cards on the letter it therefore we write 786 i said if you can't write the arabic portion write the transliteration bismillahir rahmanir rahim b i s m i l l a h no problem otherwise write the translation if the person doesn't know arabic also he can understand in the name of allah most gracious most merciful and this sickness of numerical values is present in various societies throughout the world some people consider number 13 as unlucky number 666 666 is a sign for the devil in the indian context we use charge so be 420 for a person who's a fraud this 420 number has certain logical base many of us don't know 
The reason we call a fraud or a person who cheats a 420 is because if he is arrested and if he goes to a court of law, the Indian court of law will give him a punishment under the Indian Penal Code 420. So Indian Penal Code 420 gives the punishment for a fraud. Therefore we call a fraud Achar Sobi, 420. But unfortunately even the Muslims which migrate to America and UK, they call the robbers of UK also 420. <laughs> See there, there the number will be different, won't be 420. People don't know the meaning but they use the Achar Sobi 420. But even if I agree with these people that certain Arabic numerals have certain value. But logically speaking, giving a particular number by totaling the letters of that word and using it as a short form is illogical because that same number can be used even for other words. Some may be good, some may be bad. For example, if I say the English letter B, it has got numerical value 1. A has got 7. And uh, say D has got 4. If you add up, it comes to 12. 1 plus 4 plus 7, 12. B plus A plus D, 12. Suppose I say that for G, the numerical value is 2. For O, it is 3. And for D, it is 4. So if I add up G plus G plus O plus O plus D, it will come 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, 12. So if I use 12 short form for good, it also means bad. So similarly, 7 and 6, if you add up the Arabic numerals, even if it comes to 7 and 6, there will be several other words and several other sentences. The total will also come to 7 and 6. Some will be good, some will be bad. Therefore, I do not agree with any Muslim writing shortcut numerical for Bismillah Rahman Rahim or for any Arabic word of the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. I am Mrs. Fatima Maka and I have recently joined the Islamic Studies course of Bombay University. Also, I intend to join the Arabic course. I would like to be clear in my mind before doing so. Is Quranic Arabic different from Arabic language taught Arabically? Would it help to understand the Holy Quran better if Arabic is learnt as a language? Tell us from your experience and why doesn't IRF take any step to start such a class? This is a very important question that is the normal colloquial Arabic spoken in Arabia and the Quranic Arabic the same or different and what steps is IRF taking and that reminds me that there were two three question clubs together and there was a professor of Arabic from Hyderabad who asked this question but as I said clubbing questions the chances I, I may forget she asked the question that is the colloquial Arabic different from the Quranic Arabic the colloquial Arabic sister spoken today in the Arab countries is different there are similarities, but there are differences also. Because the Arabic of the Quran is Lugha Fasa, of the Hijaz, the pure, how you say, in Urdu, Fasi Urdu. Like that is Lugha Fasa, original. There are words which are common, but a normal Arab who only knows colloquial Arabic may not be able to understand everything of the Quran. He may be able to understand quite a large portion of the Quran, but not a few words. Because there are certain words of the Holy Quran which are yet used. There are certain parts in Arab countries which still use Lugha Fusa, but very few. But the normal which you go to cities, like you have a person, many people go to Saudi Arabia, you know, to do jobs. And within 15 days they learn Arabic. What they learn? Kaifa Haluka, how are you? Ismuki, what's your name? Mirwatun fan. There's no Mirwatun in the Quran. So if you learn the normal colloquial Arabic, it will help you to understand the Quran little bit more. But I would advise the Muslim to learn Loga Fasa. Loga Fasa. The brother asked the question that what steps have IRF taken? It's unfortunate that I could not find a teacher in Arabic who knows Arabic, Loga Fasa, who can teach in English. There are many Alhamdulillah available in India, but who can teach in English there are few. And that also what they teach normally in universities and schools is the colloquial Arabic. Same thing, Ismuki, what's your name? They'll talk about Talla Sutun, the duster and the blackboard, and the Kursiyun, the chair. What I wanted, and I approached many people. We had, Alhamdulillah, one such session a couple of years ago, which we had, Alhamdulillah, about 45 students, out of which about 15 were doctors, 19 were engineers, all, because 
the course was jam packed many application came we selected the cream but due to the rash unfortunately rash took place and the course was not completed in the way that we wanted to be completed what you should learn today there are various books also available various books the sister asked me what's my experience i had a great deal of experience trying to find the teacher trying to learn myself but was quite disappointed because what i wanted i didn't acquire neither could i find the teacher etc i have approached many people not in india throughout the world inshallah we have made a good effort and now very soon we'll be having a proper course among the books available there are irf has got more than 50 different books on how to learn quranic arabic the one which i was mentioning one of them which is very simple by maulana abdul karim parekh translated into urdu first then someone translated into english he only mentions first 25 pages about arabic grammar very short very minimal arabic grammar and then translates the arabic words which occur in the fashion which occurs in the holy quran first dealing with surah baqarah all new words of arabic in surah baqarah then surah al imran which has been repeated in surah baqarah it won't be repeated in surah al imran in this way this is good only for the person who is interested in superficial understanding because the grammar is not understood well but for people who have less time this is fine other book without a teacher is by dr ibrahim turti from birmingham from birmingham he has a book along with an audio cassette and he gave a talk in irf a couple of years ago learning quranic arabic a modern method it's a book which is available in irf and in 60 hours you can learn quranic arabic these two are without teacher with a teacher one of the good books is by abdullah abbas nadwi abdullah abbas nadwi he passed off from nadwa and now at present in makkah what he has done is what we wanted that give examples of arabic words which occur in the holy quran so he gives example of apple which is in the holy quran those words which occur in the holy quran those words we give example which is good but yet we require teacher for that the person who i felt is best in my humble research not that i'm a great scholar not that i met many people but i tried to meet and alhamdulillah i met all these three people who have written all these three earlier books the person who was maximum impressed was by dr fah abdur rahim of madina university fah abdur rahim he has a novel way of teaching people and his book it's available in three volumes which has also been reprinted in madras by the islamic foundation trust it's a book which is followed by various universities throughout the world in teaching arabic and he alhamdulillah knows several languages he's a linguist at present he is the head of the department of the translation section of the king fahd printing press he has been in the marinda university for more than 25 years alhamdulillah his english is beautiful you know urdu you know various languages arabic german uh, and even uh, french spanish alhamdulillah he has a style while he teaches the foreign students he learns his language also and his different approaches that he teaches the person for example he's taking out a book on how to learn the arabic alphabet all the books that i have come across start with alif ba ta sa his book has a novel approach he has done a survey since from madras of tamil language he says the easiest letter to pronounce in tamil as compared to the arabic letter is lam the first letter is mentioned in his book is lam the other letter which is easier is mim so it comes mim moment you learn lam along with it he teaches fatta dama kasra la li lu what we learn normally is alif ba ya alif ba te fa out there alif ba ta sa and then after reading all the letters then we start a e u ba bi bu this is a different approach the letter which is easiest pronounced in tamil language is lam so it starts with la li lu then mim ma mi mu then with these two letters he forms word lam lim lum and then he says even a person doesn't know the order yet he can understand and then he goes on how to read the arabic without fatta dama kasra and i had a opportunity to spend time with him for a few days alhamdulillah he is a great scholar and a unique approach inshallah we have requested him to come to irf we have requested abdullah abbas nadwi to come to irf all of them have agreed so inshallah after ramadan we may be having such a quranic course which inshallah will be a unique one and we see to it that we video record it so that people who are not present do they may not be able to get that same impact they will at least have the gist of it
Hope that answers the question. Our Hindu brothers, the relevant question, therefore I'm just closing the program today with this question and the vote of thanks, I'll be following up. Our Hindu brothers say that in Quran, it is said, cut down the kafirun, so it should be banned. Would you please explain the background of cutting down, or kital, of kafir, reference to Tawbah? The brother, non-Muslim brother of ours, they have given a reference to Surah Tawbah, that the Quran says, cut down the kafir. Kill them. So the book should be banned. Can you explain? The brother mentioned the chapter number. He didn't give the verse number. The brother is referring to the verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, which does say that wherever you find a kafir, kafir, one who rejects the truth, a mushrik, you kill him. And this verse is quoted very often by the skeptics, by the critics of Islam, especially people like Arun Shuri and Tasnim al And they say that, see, Islam is a ruthless way of life. It says that wherever you find a kafir, kill him. It brackets, they write Hindu. Indicating that the Quran says wherever you find a Hindu, kill him. They, they are the people who are doing mischief. Mischief. If you analyze, let's suppose there is a war going on between Vietnam and America. And the American army general or the American president tells the soldiers in the battlefield, that wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him. But natural, the army general of America, he is telling to boost up the morale in the battlefield. He has to say that. But today, several years later, if I write that the American president or American army general said that wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him, you will make him sound like a butcher. It's out of context. So similarly, the context of this verse, you have to read from verse number one. There was a peace treaty between the Mushriks, the Kafirs of Makkah and the Muslims. This peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah, by the Kafirs of Makkah. At that time Allah revealed this verse, that we give you a time of four months, otherwise our declaration of war. Verse number four says that. Verse number five says that wherever it is the Muslim, wherever you find the Kafir, kill him. It's to boost up the morale. In the battlefield, these mushriks who took you out of the house, these mushriks, if you read the context, they took the Muslims out of the land. These mushriks today, they have broken the peace treaty. In the battlefield, don't get scared. Fight them. Kill them. And after verse number 5, Arun Shuri in his book, World of Fatwa, quotes verse number 7. Any logical person understands verse number 6 is missing. Why? Verse number 6 gives the answer. Verse number 6 says that if any of these kafirs and mushriks seek asylum, give it to them. Quran does not stop there. Quran says, escort him to a place of security so that he will hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran does not say when any of these mushriks, these enemies, seek asylum, don't just let him go. Quran says, escort him to a place of security. Tell me which army general today in the world who will be so generous so merciful, maximum Italian soldier, that if an enemy wants to go, let him go. Which army general today will say, escort him to a place of security? Quran says, don't just let those kafir go, escort them to a place of security, so that they will hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the battlefield, this context is there. In the battlefield, don't get scared, fight the people who drive you out of your house, fight them, those who fight you. Don't get scared. But if they seek asylum, escort them to a place of security. So Islam, alhamdulillah, it promotes communal harmony more than whatever the, all the others you and know and human rights, what they're talking today, Quran mentioned 14 years ago. <laughs> today human rights and women rights and so many organizations talking about peace, 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 all that is given in the Holy Quran. So because it comes from the book of the Muslims, they don't want to say, they don't want to quote that. So what today the world is talking about, how to give human rights that you should not differentiate between caste, color, creed, sex, etc. This Quran has already mentioned 14 years ago. It should not be banned. It should be promoted and made and translated into all the various languages of the world and given free. We thank Almighty Allah for making this program possible for all of us here today. On behalf of the IRF, I thank all our esteemed guests 
and brothers and sisters present here today for their interest and enthusiasm displayed. We appreciate and thank all persons of the professional video recording team, mostly from the USL 20th Century Fox Studios, who have recorded this event for more millions of others to see. Lastly, I would like to congratulate and thank our many volunteers in the organizing committees, all around me and outside, some not watching the program, for their dedicated effort in the organization of this program for all of us. Jazakallah khair. You may keep in touch with the IRF and its regular programs, including watching IRF program broadcast across 68 countries all over the world by the ATN satellite TV channels on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 6 to 6.30 a.m. We hope to meet you all again, inshallah, at our next public talk on Concept of God in Major Religions by Dr. Zakir Naik on Sunday, 26 October 1997 at 9.30 a.m. sharp at Birla Matushri Auditorium next to Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.